Welcome to a very special edition of Ask GC Anything, as we're very lucky to have with us on this week's show none other than former Olympic medalist, former World Time Trial Champion and current duathlon long distance champion, Emma Pooley. Welcome, Emma, to the show and thanks very much for coming in. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. Well, first off, just to set the scene just a little bit, just for me first, I'm going to ask a question. What we've done, we've thrown, uh, out, thrown it out on social media to viewers of GCN to ask lots of questions. We have over 20 questions for you, but one of the most fascinating things for me about your career, better known, of course, as a remarkably successful road cyclist. Then, then you moved on to, to duathlon, then triathlon, but fascinating thing for me. What about that transition? How did you find moving up from one discipline to the next? Well, um, I actually did triathlon before I got into cyclism, so I didn't, didn't publicise it much when I was a cyclist, okay. for obvious reasons, but I was a, I did sort of Olympic distance trials on that, and I actually was a runner as a kid, so I had a, a I wasn't a very good runner, but I had a background in running training, and it, um, so the running side was kind of easy, because I'd always run in the off-season, when it's cold, and when I had to work, and um, in fact, I love running, so I'd always want to run straight after the World, the world Championships every year. Um, okay. um, so I, I thought it would be fairly straightforward. Um, it turned out I was a bit rubbish at swimming, and I still am, despite trying my best, um, with some good coaching help. Um, I didn't get much better. So um, in the end, I found them with triathlon, I had to pick my races where the swim was less important. So uh, the transition was fun and only moderately successful, I would say. Okay, so what was the catalyst for that transition in the first place? Was it kind of looking back at... Maybe was it the road scene not quite to your liking, or was it? Or the, what, I, I was just wanted to different challenges. I think like um, I, I mean I, I really enjoyed my time cycling um, most of the time, and um, I'm really I had a great time. I met some wonderful people, and like I have lots. Of, I don't regret it, doing it at all. But I just there were I kind of I think I felt the pull of these sort of iconic triathlon races like Alpe d'Huez and Norseman. I still want to do, and um, there's one called Embrun in France, and there are all these sort of crazy races where. Um, Get to race in the mountains, which I kind of missed a bit in women's cycling. Which you are sometimes. rather good at, aren't you? Well, I don't know. Maybe just no one else tries it. Put <laughs> no. half an hour into me in uh, the Kingdom Mountains Challenge, by the way. Yeah, well, I trained very specifically <laughs> for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I wanted. It was more that I felt the pull of these iconic races that involved um, mountains generally. So. Okay. Yeah. okay. Well, we've got quite a few questions from you, as I've said. So we'll crack on. The first question comes from Victor Lundquist two three one over on Instagram, who asks Emma, "What is your favourite race?" To watch and also to ride. Uh, to watch would probably be Flesh Well On, but it's not my favourite to ride because uh, <laughs> having raced it is incredibly stressful, and so I enjoy watching it because I I know how you you know it's great watching someone race it well because you know where you should be in the bunch. But as a rider, it was incredibly stressful. Um, as an as a rider myself, and uh, I think either. Uh, there's a race in Switzerland called the Cura Rosa, which is just all uphill. Uh, so as a road race, that was very straightforward, <laughs> just okay. full gas. And and the Taiwan KOM similarly in that it's um, I, I was never very good at riding the bunch, so I found that a bit stressful. So anything that goes uphill straight away was kind of less stressful. So because you can pretty much dictate what happens when it's going uphill. But uh, although flesh will on is uh, the men's and the women's race remarkably stressful all about the Mio de Hoy and of course uh, you're a multiple winner of that event as well aren't you? Only once sadly. What, was it, I thought it was no, you won it once. I wish. No, I, I, multiple DNFs actually. Okay. Uh, I, that was the most unlucky race for me. I had I think a couple of times in ambulance and it oh. is a very stressful race and, and it's all about where you are and, and, and the, everyone thinks about the Mio de Hoy but it's about what you do earlier in the race obviously like you know how tired you are when you get there and if you're even still there and a couple of times I didn't make it <laughs> it was very stressful so it's just there's been a couple of questions before we move on um you know you're very diminutive in stature and I mean, one of the things the interesting things, things for me a stressful race like the flesh will on how did you find imposing yourself in the peloton when it gets extremely stressful because that must have been you know it's a genuine a genuine issue for you yeah. know, if you're not one of the bigger stronger riders yeah. although you've you, you clearly got that craft there it's like how did you kind of impose yourself um, uh, I didn't really. That's kind of the problem. So yeah, no. So the year I won Flesh Wallon is because I had a fantastic team. I mean, I was in good shape, but it was more that I had a fantastic team around me. And you know, in road racing, um, you can you can save a lot of energy by being protected in the peloton. Okay. So that year we had a we had a really strong team, and um, I was the I was the protected rider. So I was looked after, and it's much easier to stay in the right place in the bunch when you've got a presence of teammates around yeah. you. Um, other times, if I wasn't, you know, if I was a workhorse, it was fine because I could sit on the front or do something useful. But um, um, I've always, because I started cycling relatively late, I, I did struggle with the peloton skills. And also, I can't see anything. If I'm not on the side or at the front, I all I can see is just a sea of people um, and I can't okay. see what's coming up in the road. So There we go. Well, uh, next up, this is a question again on Instagram from uh, Katiaf. 
Uh, apologies if I've pronounced that wrong. I do do that quite often, so please bear with me. Uh, hi, Emma. I'm 22 and I've just started in cycling. Do you think it's too late? What advice can you give to people who are starting in their 20s? That's not that young, is it? Uh, or how old is it really? It's not that old. That's the no. age I was when I started road racing. So I think that's a perfectly reasonable age to start cycling. Um, uh, I think it, it's never too late for a start. I mean, that isn't that isn't late, but even if you were 52, it's not too late. Um, it's a great sport to take up. I think um, I... What I really enjoyed about getting into cycling was um, the community. So I learnt most by riding with the club um, when I was um, a student and the student club and the town club in Cambridge and people were incredibly helpful. And I would say um, the world of bikes can be quite confusing and stressful and expensive when you're not used to it. And um, you could spend many, many hours reading all the stuff or watching GCN videos, which helps. But I think that the best thing you can do is get advice off friends because um, so ride with the club and get to know people and that way you also get to know great routes I'm not sort of looking at a phone the whole time so other people is my advice for getting into cycling and I'd, I'd I'd give you advice and yeah, definitely. give you their spare old wheels and their spare kit and stuff so. I think that's I think I can speak for Dan and for Simon and for, and for Tom as well and myself that's how we got all into cycling through yeah. through the clubs yeah. and uh, that's one of the best ways to learn is find a, find a group of yeah. people that you trust and go yeah. out riding and you'll learn very very quickly yeah. that way yeah to be honest I hated cycling when I started because I got cold and I was only doing it as cross training and I only carried on because the people were friendly and nice, and we stopped for coffee at a garden centre every weekend. Cracking so soon. <laughs> Cycling's got cracking so soon. We can talk about coffee and, and cakes all day. So next up, we have this question over on Instagram again from Mike underscore Vesta10. Who were your idols growing up, and when did you start competitively racing? Um, so when I was growing up, I was a runner, so my idols were Paul Radcliffe and Kelly Holmes. Um, uh, I remember watching the London Marathon as a kid, and she ran every mile of the London Marathon quicker than I could run even the 1500 on the track, and it was just incredible to me. And she... I think those those two runners, their personalities of sort of humility came across really well, even though they were great champions. So, um, I raced as a as a from when I was about. Um, f- actually, my first sport was rowing, so I started rowing racing when I was uh, thirteen. But it turned out that I wasn't quite the right size. So then I started. I did some cross country running when I was from about fifteen onwards, and then um, didn't get into bike racing till I was uh, twenty two. Yeah, I never even had an under twenty three season because I was already wow. yeah. There we go. When you did the Olympic day, uh, Olympic Games, did you get to meet your heroes? Did yes, you get to, get to speak to Kelly and oh, Sue Paula? It, yeah, so I was on the same flight back um, from Beijing as Paula Radcliffe and um, I mustered up the courage to get her autograph and it's still in pride of place at home and I'm sure she was fed up but she was very gracious about it and um, it was wonderful to meet her. And um, I met Kelly Holmes uh, in uh, one of the um, sort of post-Olympic um, Things, events, yeah, things, events, yeah. yeah. And of course, that was the year you won, you got the silver medal, wasn't yeah, it? On that, t- yeah. that really tough course in Beijing. Yeah, it was, it was a good course. <laughs> good course, designed, almost yeah. designed for you. Um, well, next up, we have this question from Lang, another underscore, Lang underscore Augustine uh, of an Instagram. What is the best way to get into competitive cycling? I'm transitioning from rowing into cycling and I'm not sure how to step into the competition scene. Um, uh, well, it depends what kind of cycling you want to do, I think. Um, I think that in the UK, well, probably most countries in the world, there's, there's, there's sort of graded races, so um, you can probably get a, um, you can get a day licence for, for sort of um, some races, um, or I think I started out on sort of a bronze level British cycling licence. And okay. um, Yeah, and again, I think that um, going riding with a club is a really useful way to, to meet people who race a bit, um, choose your club obviously, um, and and share a lift to a race and people who give you a bit of advice. Um, but first I think, try a few, try some local time trials. So time trialling is the easiest logistically. That's how I got into it as well, yeah, that's my first competitive like, thing. So. Almost every town has local time trials in the evening after work and there's very um, logistically easy, you just rock up and pay your 10 quid and there's often cake, you know, afterwards. So What's not watched, to like? Yeah. What's not to like? Um, uh, yeah, and generally the cake and the tea and the coffee is free if you give your number in as well. So you've like prepaid for your brews. That. Oh. Well, that's what it was like in the 80s. Wow. Maybe, well, I haven't written the time trial <laughs> no, since 1995. It's not free anymore. I think so. it's at least 50p. Oh, no. Sorry about that. Misinformation <laughs> there. Uh, moving moving swiftly on from this, to this question from Willy, Willy Alien. 20, some cracking names on social media. Willy Alien 2017. Um, how do you feel about the restructuring of the women's road calendar? Um, uh, the... Uh, UCI calendar. World, yeah, world, world, world tour, yeah I, I think it's great. I think um, they've been talking about this for a while about having two tiers of racing, and um, I think um, I think it, I think it is important. And the the, the the people who are trying to make changes at the UCI are doing a good job in that they're trying to move it in the direction of, of having two tiers of teams and two tiers of races because that is important. Because at the moment, previously there's been just a um, the, the the category of UCI team has covered a very large swathe of, of budgets and abilities and and standards, and it's sort of been a bit unfair on the lower teams and, and I think you've got to see racing as 
it's entertainment, but also for the people that race it, you know, it, it's, it's just a bit harsh on some of the, yeah. the starter teams that are trying to help people progress if they have never have a chance. So I think it's excellent and um, I, hope it, I hope it works out well. I know there's been a few tweaks this season to the, to the Women's World Tour calendar because just, just to explain that, there are, oh, there's only one tier, there's, there's World Tour racing, but if you're a UCI women's team, you can, you can ride in those events, but I think it's the top 15 teams or top yeah. 20 teams now that actually get into the events, but yeah. everybody essentially is classed as the same. Yeah. But, but the sport is heading in the right direction, yeah. but I, I do agree, yeah. a, a two-tiered structure yeah. in, a, a, yeah. would be, I think, would be a definite yeah. boon. I think more gradation, basically, because otherwise it's like, it's like going, you know, some, some people have the physical talent to go from, from amateur to top level World Cup, uh, World Tour straight away, but it, for some people it's like, you know, going from 11, you know, primary school to A-levels, and, it, and it's, it's not that people don't have the talent, it's just that you need time to build the skills and the, and the experience, and, um, and if racing is going to be entertaining, which is, it should be, um, then it, it needs to be competitive, so I think that, that structuring is really good. Great stuff. Well, uh, next up we have this question from Nick Humby over on Twitter this time. How should, st staying uh, with women's cycling, how should we encourage more women into racing at grassroots level? Good question. Um, well, I think that just getting more women into cycling at grassroots level, just being welcoming and um, making it more accessible. And I think whether people want to race or not, I'm, I'm, I'm wary of pushing people into racing. So I, I enjoy racing and I know lots of women do, but I don't think that it's an inevitable path for everyone. And some people are never going to want to race, guys and well, Most girls. people won't race. And yeah. I know British and cycling membership, there's a very small amount yeah, of people that race. Exactly. You know? and, and cycling is first of all a mode of transport and then entertainment and, and fun and a leisure activity. And the racing the racing scene is, it was important to me and, and I care about it, but not everyone not everyone wants to race. So I don't think one should assume that oh, just because a woman um, takes up cycling and, and is even super strong that she's necessarily going to go, gonna want to race. But if, you know, um, I think, yeah, I, I, um, I, th I think... British cycling's moving in the right direction, but I think if there, I think personally, if there were more um, more races in the UK, and I know the the women's racing scene has come on a lot, so there are far more races now than when I started. But if there were more um, sort of starter level races and, and a sort of again a graded graded system to, to move upwards, then I think that would help people because it is tricky if you if you want to do a race but you have to drive for two hours to get there yeah. or or um, or it's a quite high level race, so it's it's a bit intimidating then. Um, yeah, but I, I think certainly the, the time training scene is very accessible to women as well. So. I think just just on, on that point, encouraging more women to racing, and it's like the first step is to encourage them to ride a bike, isn't it? And, yeah. I, and yeah. I, I was reading an article about a year ago now. One of the biggest blockers to women riding bikes is kind of is safety on the roads. Yeah. There's a perception that the roads are unsafe, yeah. and it's the same with young people as well, with yeah. kids getting getting into cycling. Yeah. So I think it's a it's a bigger story, isn't it? It's like like slowly changing yeah. infrastructure to make people, people in general, yeah. including women, yeah. feel safe on the roads, get them on their bikes, yeah. and then having a you know a broader race offering to get yeah, them racing exactly. if, they, if they want to do so. The thing I care about most is that people ride their bikes yeah. and enjoy it and, and get you know more cars off the roads and, and have fun and get fit, so yeah. Good stuff. I, I mean, the other, the other thing with women racing is I think that the more racing that women's racing that's seen on tv or on youtube or it, it, the more that is inspirational to people and i know quite a lot of people who've wanted to try a race because they've watched the olympics or something and uh, certainly a lot of people got in touch with me after london saying oh that was amazing to watch um not me but the race and um and um i'm gonna try my local crit and i think that's great so um so i think the more the more coverage there is out there of women's racing the better uh, next up, we've got this question from Kevin Cole 10 who asks, what's been the piece of equipment that you thought wasn't going to help you, but ended up being a game changer? Um, I don't know about game changer, but the thing I was really sceptical about was DI2 and electric shifting. And, and when it came out, I thought, oh, rubbish, whenever it rains, it's going to short circuit and there's no way that's going to work. And rubbish, rubbish. And then um, for a few seasons, I was on mechanical um, Shimano and kept getting dropped by people who could effortlessly shift into the big ring on a climb and it was getting quite annoying and last season um, my sponsor arranged that I had DI2 on my race bike and it was fantastic. So you're quite and a late adopter to very, electric shifting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I did use it on just for a couple of years um, on my bike at World Championships um, for time trial only because sometimes it's very, the, the thing with DI2 you can have the shifters in two places so but um, never on the road bike because basically I was on teams that couldn't quite afford it. So, okay. um, and it, oh my goodness, it's fantastic. It really, um, yes, yeah, so it get a bit lazy, like, you know, going back to mechanical, it's like, oh, I have to put some effort into shifting. Yeah, you yeah. have to put torque through your, yeah, your fingers and yeah. stuff. You don't want to be doing things like that, wasting energy. <laughs> no, do, waste of energy, uh... exactly. Yeah, so that, that's the thing that really surprised me. And uh, I have to admit that I was, I was wrong. I, I, I think, <laughs> same, same for me. I think uh, I was a little bit sort of skeptical of it, but I just wouldn't go back now. You know, I wouldn't go back. Lucky enough to have it on most of my bikes. But yeah, it is, I think yeah. it is the, one of the biggest game changers. Um, next up is this uh, from uh, Matt Gavino. What was the total weight of your bike, your Bond bike that you used in the KOM Challenge? 
7.4 kilos. 7.4 kilos. That's, that's pretty, pretty light, isn't it? Still yeah. put. Yeah. Ours was 6.8. Yeah. Still, yeah. Do you know what? Anyway, <laughs> move, moving on. Let's not dwell yeah. on, on that. I think it would have been easier for me to lose. <laughs> it would have been cheaper for me to lose 600 grams off myself than off the bike. So I should have done that. <laughs> Uh, we have a question here from Fab underscore Star underscore Ha. Uh, will you be racing Ironman in 2018? Uh, no. no, no. I'm going to do some triathlons. Uh, I want to do Norseman, but not Ironman. No. Okay, Norseman. That's that's a pretty brutal triathlon, yeah, isn't it? So it's the same distances as an Ironman, but um, it's set in, it's in Norway in the fjords, and you you jump into a boat in off a boat into a fjord in the freezing cold in the dark. Um, it sounds I like mountain, and then the, the, the you know the run and the ride are both mountainous. But I like the mountains, but I don't like the cold. So I'm gonna have to do some kind of cold weather training. I think. Well, our, our resident triathlete, uh, Mark Thrillfall, where we I think it was suggested he was going to do it, but he's somehow side sort of sloped his shoulders, isn't he? He's not going to be doing that one. But uh, I mean, you <laughs> talk about. Because he heard I was going. I think it might be. I don't know, <laughs> to be honest, probably heard it on the great one somewhere. But uh, just just looking back through your career, that's the latter part of your career. The type of just a question from me now. The the type of events that you've entered, they really are you know, extreme challenges. Is that something that you've found, you've clearly been maybe cherry picking the events to kind yeah. of suit your kind of physiological and mental a- attributes, but something do, something like the Norseman, that's that's brutal. Is that something yeah. that you kind of... You yeah, still, totally, because yeah. I mean, like physiologically, I'm, I'm, I like climbing. I, I like it mentally, but also I think I'm better at the, I'm just better at hilly races than I'm at flat races. Like I've, I've tried some flat Ironman events and I was rubbish and, you know, they're not, they're not bad at cycling these other athletes. They're very, very good. They're yeah. strong all around athletes and, I don't have much of a physiological advantage when it's flat and long. And I also got a bit bored. Whereas with mountains to take off, I, you know, I love riding up, you know, racing the mountains. I love the scenery and it, um, actually enjoy the racing. So yeah. And that was one of the reasons I wanted to do triathlon was to be able to race up, you know, Alpe d'Huez, whereas yeah. I never, never got to ride that as a cyclist competitively really. So. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, a very simple question here. What is your favorite pre-ride meal? And that comes from Sergio Anstram. Um, uh, so I am quite into sort of breakfast at any time of day. Oh, so yeah. all day yeah. breakfast. Yeah. So por- and porridge is the thing. Like I think oats are cheap and they're nutritious and they're a good blend of carbohydrates. So unless I'm, if I was about to do a time trial, I probably wouldn't have porridge because it's a bit, yeah, a bit heavy. Mm. But um, no, I generally have porridge pre-ride, pre-training, and uh, make these porridge cakes, which are pretty tasty. Porridge too. cakes. They sound amazing. Uh, they're better than they sound actually. Most can you people. Share the, can you share the kind of recipe on? on no, the now? no. I'm writing oh, a recipe no. book, so you'll have to buy the book. <laughs> I'll bring you a cake, just, but just you can't know the recipe. Random book plug midway through <laughs> RTC. I love it yep. when that sort of yep. stuff happens. Great stuff. Okay, this next up is this over on Facebook from Nicola Grant. Um, back in the uh, back in early 2012, Emma was training in Australia and told me her post cycle recovery was chocolate milk and nuts. Have you changed your nutrition since then, or do you still swear by it? Smiley face. Do you remember that person? Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> sorry, um, sorry I, Nicola, if you're I, watching. I, I am a strong advocate of chopped milk as, as post-ride recovery or, or iced coffee, anything with milk and a bit of sugar, basically. Um, I don't remember the nuts. Like, I do really like snacking on nuts, but I wouldn't generally eat them straight after riding. Um, they're quite... So fats are generally take longer to digest, so straight after training or towards the end of training, you want to have simple sugars that will refuel your muscle cell straight away. So, yep. um, yeah. In fact, I try and keep off the nuts because I can eat... So, they're so delicious and I just... Calories. What's your favourite? What's your favourite nut? Mine's pistachio for the record. What's walnut. your favourite walnut? Walnut, walnut pistachios. Yeah. Leave your favourite nuts <laughs> in the comment section down below. Uh, squirrels uh, included. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next up is this from Paul Wright over on Facebook. What is your split between running and riding when training for duathlons? And is the running hit, so high intensity interval training, or longer endurance type runs? Um, so uh, for me, I, I try and run as much as I can without getting injured, which um, is was always my limiting factor, I'm afraid. Yeah. So um, I, I try and run ideally five times a week and um, I try and do one long run a week and a couple of interval sessions, so one flat and one um, one hill interval session, um, which is, uh, the, I find hill intervals really useful because a lot of the races I do are hilly and also it's much less damaging on your legs so you can get a, mass, a really good cardiovascular workout without so much muscular damage. Um, and then a couple of um, easier runs or um, brick runs or drill sessions and I find those really useful. Um, so five runs a week optimally but if I'm worried about injury then I'll cut that down to three um, but the, the important thing for me is regular running because if you if I leave running for a, a month or so I'm you you know you, you feel terrible when you go back to it so um and then um yeah riding that depends on the time of year and what they're sure. training for but yeah and it also depends how much time I've got because riding is quite time consuming I got quite into my Zwift uh, last autumn training for the KOM and it was really good in that it was Super time efficient and hard, a bit like a run. You could yep. get a really good workout in an hour. So I'm a big fan of that. Good stuff. In terms of the running, do you, 
do you just do road running or do you mix it up? Do you run sand when you can or do you do cross country? Because um, I, I, I was yeah. coming from a running background. Yeah. Like I used to, if I had a bit of a niggle, I kind of run run on fields a little yeah. bit. So it yeah. t- took, the, took the shock a little bit. Yeah, I love running off road. It's more okay. fun. And um, and uh, yeah, and again, I do a bit of trail running racing wise. And so um, it's important to remember that sort of technical foot agility thing, sure. which um, if you don't if you didn't practice it, you you get lazy ankles. So um, I try and run off road if I can. It's a bit softer. Um, but sometimes if it's dark or super muddy or there's not much time and road is the only way yeah good stuff well uh, next up is this question from ellis pullinger do you change your training each year or have you found something that works for you and you just stick to what you know best or i mean because i was adapting my training all the way through my career basically yeah. i never really had any coach but i kind of just cherry picked her and was adapting to or are you kind of a bit of a yeah. traditionalist or oh no i've my tra- training has changed hugely so i think when i yeah especially because well the events i train for have changed a lot over the years and when i started cycling i was very totally clueless and um, I had a, a, a fantastic coach and he didn't really so much set training as sort of guided the overall training plot yep. and um, I just found that when I started cycling the more I did the better I got because I was I didn't have that background in cycling and then um, it got to a point in my career where I realised that doing more was really not helping and that I was just getting tired so I had to then I had to stop planning my training <laughs> and now I, now I yeah uh, um, yeah with triathlon and stuff it, it's very event dependent like how I train so I do obviously think about it and so for the Taiwan KOM I, I I didn't run for about a month before because I didn't want to wreck the race. <laughs> Have you got any tips for me and Si about the KOM challenge? What did we do wrong? We just uh, went fit enough, were we? I think... You, I think <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, no. no, no. I think that... Because yeah, I'd done it the year before, so I had a lot of experience. And, and like it's an event where it really helps to know like you know the lie of the land and, and how, where to be in the bunch. And, you know, I'll That's give you some tips. I'll give you some, you know. Thanks. So, I'll, so, so when we finish this, I will sit down with my notepad and get some more tips. <laughs> Definitely need some. Uh, Bit of an odd question here, uh, a curveball type question from Drayton Knowles over on Twitter. Do you know that Dan Lloyd actually rode for the Cervelo test team? Did he? So he <laughs> yeah. says. Yeah. Obviously, like, I know. Obviously not not the race. original Cervelo test team. He wasn't on the women's team. No, that was the original team. Not that, as far as we no. know. Well, but, uh, no, no. He no. would have stood out. I mean, he, you know, we had some tall girls, but he's pretty tall. <laughs> he would have stood out. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. I think we, yeah, we, no. we, there, there was an awareness of Lloyd's presence. Here it was a good team, and it was a great team because the men's and women's team, had, we had a lot to do with each other, and we yeah. had training camps together. It was awesome, yeah. What, so. was, it, what was it like? Was it as strange it as it was in real life? Yeah, but in a good way. In a good way. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we love Lloyd here, really. <laughs> uh, next up is for this question from Neil Ablard, who asks, does Emma think uh, we're heading towards parity for women's events, back to women's cycling again, anytime soon? Sponsors seem to be slowly coming on board, but not quickly enough. Why not? What, what do you think? Uh, given the close and exciting racing that the girls give us, uh, with as many marketable personalities as the men have, so we talked about the sport heading in the right direction. Do you think it? Do you think the pace of change is quick enough? Uh, I don't. You know, as a as an ex pro cyclist, I'd, I'd like to see it a bit quicker. I think I, I got a bit frustrated with the slowness of it, but I, it is moving in the right direction. And the thing that I have to remind myself of is that cycling is a sport with a huge amount of history, yeah. and um, you know, you can't just change things overnight and that's that's a good thing because you know that history is a, is a richness in the sport that we all appreciate and I it is moving in the right direction I think um the more fans like like you that that want to watch women cycling that I think the more you call out for better coverage of women's races because there is some fantastic racing out there that it doesn't get covered at all and it's all very well reading tweets or or race reports but the thing that really hooks people is watching footage and so I think the more um the more fans that say we want to watch it then then race organisers will be able to invest in the coverage and then sponsors will see the advantage. And But the, the prize money, I it, obviously it would be nice, but that's that's the last concern. Like The important thing is to have the races available and have people able to watch them. And then, so, build, and then build it from there, basically, exactly, so you yeah. get the commercial work. And the most important thing in. is that the races are available. And so I think it's it's important to be super grateful to the race organisers who do an amazing job. And a lot of them, it's, it's not even their main job to put on women's races and they do a really good job of it. So. Next up is this question from Gabrielle Rivest. I'd be really curious to see what Emma thinks about the use of one by drivetrains for road bikes. Uh, one of the possible races that she sees it been using is the Taiwan KOM Challenge, uh, where it's all about weight, and I guess you rarely change between chain rings. Well, I hardly did, that's for sure, apart from at the start. Do you think it is suitable for the Taiwan KOM Challenge? Uh, personally, not not for me. Um, so I have, the only time I've used a one by is, is um, in the London Olympic time trial, because it was pretty flat and I was never going to use a small ring and it was slightly more aero. Um, but I um, I found that actually the Taiwan race is, is actually not all just a steady uphill gradient. It's actually very changeable, especially at the start. And yeah. then the end is very steep and you actually really need a big range of gears. So for myself, no, but I know, um, it's not something I've really looked into for myself for racing, especially because um, I, I like 
proper mountain. So you need a big gift going downhill and you need a small gift going uphill. And then it, like two chain rings is the obvious. Um, so I, I think not for Taiwan, but um, I'm you know open to discussion about it. I'd love to learn about it. And just off the back of that question, obviously we've got the uh, the, pro, the Irish pro continental team, Aqua Blue. This season, they're going to be using one buys exclusively throughout wow. the year. Um, I know we've, we've done some videos on, yeah. on the kind of how they have to work the ratios. What do you think of that? What are your thoughts? Um, interesting. That? I should probably look into it before I comment. <laughs> so, I'm, but before I make any silly comments, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll watch the video. But no, it's, it's certainly it's, it's fascinating <laughs> yeah. the way things are moving, gravel yeah. bikes, etc. Yeah. But uh, it does get you thinking a lot. It's yeah. a very very interesting subject. Yeah. Well, this question now from Fatin Liana Hassan over on Facebook. As a petite rider, I find it very challenging to ride alone on the flat, especially where there are headwinds and crosswinds involved. How do I train to mitigate this? A really good question there. You touched yeah. on it a little bit before. Yeah, so that's something that um, I totally sympathise with as a small person. And I, you just the fact is that as a, as a small person with a small body mass and, and small muscle mass, you're never going to be... You're always going to be at a slight disadvantage on the flat, especially when it's windy, because... Um, you, you're you're smaller for the for the sort of the drag than a big person obviously, but not as much smaller as your power is less. So we small people have an advantage going uphill, but a disadvantage on the flat and in in crosswinds. Um, so training wise, I mean power is power. Your legs don't know whether you're going uphill or on the flat. So any training you do that gets you fitter is going to be good. But um, the most important thing, obviously, when it's windy, is position on your bike um, to be aerodynamic. So the smaller you can get, and, and that's also, it really helps to have a bike that fits you, um, which is something that as a small person, I've struggled with over the years as well. And so um, really paying attention to whether you can get low enough at the front. And um, so I guess the training you could do is to sort of help your hip flexibility to get really low. And um, So yeah. look at your position, aerodynamics yeah. is absolutely yeah, exactly key, key, but there's only so much you can do to, to mitigate it if you're particularly yeah, right. Yeah, but, um, but yeah, I mean, um, there are some very small riders who are excellent time trialists also on the flat and in the wind so it's, it's not don't give up on it it's just that you've got to you've got to be clever about it and you've got to if, you, if you're riding up in the wind um, on the flat then you know you're a big disadvantage so yeah. get as small as you can and that involves bike as well and so the bike is important because it has to fit you yeah. just on, on that note uh, we're going to go into a question uh, from Gordon Richardson uh, over on Facebook who asks 650B wheels versus 700C wheels do you use the smaller wheels purely for sizing or do you find them more efficient in some way um, so I used 650C when I was racing for time trials and last year as well yeah, last year as well for triathlon, and um, yeah, because I can't get the right position otherwise. So um, um at my height, um, if I have seven hundred C wheels, I just cannot get low enough at the front to be aerodynamic. So, um, the only time I was successful on a time trial bike with seven hundred C wheels was the Beijing Olympics, where British Cycling made me, uh, they made a fork with a base bar for the handlebar that came out of the fork, so it was right, super okay. low. Um, you you're not allowed to do that anymore under the rules. So uh, I just cannot get low. Has enough. to be a bike that's commercially available, basically, doesn't it? For this uh, part of the uh... in theory, they could sell that. Yeah. Handle, but but that wasn't the problem. It's just that you're not allowed to have the base bar coming out of the oh, okay. fork anymore. That's just one of the rules that they changed. So um, yeah, just for geometry, um, it also actually handles way better for someone my size. So um, if you can imagine someone like you know six foot tall on an eight hundred C bike, that's what it's like for me riding a seven hundred C bike. So it um, feels a bit toe crossover and all that stuff too. Okay, um, Luke Ryder asks, do you think the relatively high earnings of element to women in triathlon means that the strongest female cyclists aren't necessarily in cycling? Uh, I think that's totally impossible to tell because there aren't many people that cross over. So um, I think that the strongest cyclists are in cycling probably. And there are some, um, you know, triathletes are very strong cyclists, but it's a totally different sport. You don't ride in the same attacking way in, a, in an Ironman or or even an Olympic distance triathlon, the, sure. the bike section is very different. So I think that's really hard to tell. Okay. Um, ben Barber asked, the penultimate question now, uh, what are the biggest things to focus on to improve your time in time trialing? So just all round time trialing tips. Uh, I think you can make the biggest difference in your in your fitness. Of course. <laughs> so training wise, um, train for the event you're doing. So if it's hilly, then, you know, train that. And, and otherwise you, you know, work out how long you're going to be time trialing for roughly in an ideal situation and practice it suffering for as, as well as possible for that duration <laughs> one of the one of the it, i think things are changing now uh, or ch have changed now in terms of riding time trials some riders ride to power some riders don't ride to power but i was a reasonable time trialist when i put my mind to it mm. but in a uh, 40k time trial i quite often used to be thinking about what's having fatigue yeah so it's not just the physiological no. side but yeah. we the know that time trial is it is it's a dark art isn't it yeah. it's it's uh, equal, equal, it's, it's much important to get yeah. your mental kind of approach right so how do you you're a consummate time trialist former world champion mentally what's the most important thing what's the crucial thing um, for you yeah you have to really care about it you have to really suffer so i mean um 
and I've had times where I haven't done very well and, and it wasn't that I didn't get the time I wanted it was that I was disappointed with the lack of effort during the and if I basically if I was mentally fatigued which sounds silly but if I was overtrained or fed up or I didn't want to be there then I didn't put the effort in and it wasn't even deliberate it wasn't like I was being lazy but you've got to arrive at a race ready to just empty your tank and suffer and I think for me some of the one of my, I think one of the best time trials I ever did was um, my first attempt at the Worlds where I, it wasn't a, a glorious result but um, I had a bike that didn't really fit me I was very inexperienced at that level and I I totally emptied the tank like I was coughing for days afterwards and right. um, I'm quite I'm still quite proud of the effort I put in yeah. <laughs> even if it wasn't the best result of my career and I think that's the thing you've just got to suffer like time running yeah. is about hurting for that long so go there fresh and you've got to really want it yeah if you haven't suffered you haven't done enough really basically no. so that's the short toilet <laughs> Okay, our last question today, Emma, is from Matthew Lewis over on Facebook. What is Emma's favourite guilty treat? Oh, well, I try not to feel guilty about stuff because I think it's a wasted emotion. But um, uh, I do like my food, um, but I try and balance that out with exercise. So. Okay. But if you're talking about unhealthy foods that I like, um, I'm a big fan of cheese and chocolate and okay. red wine. There's quite a few things that I would so just happily, like a normal yeah. person. Just like, really, yeah. Yeah, let's, be, let's be honest yeah, with you. I do love cheese, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I try and sort of moderate it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. a good feeling guilty about it is not, you know, it's not worth the hassle. No. So you know, enjoy your food and enjoy your training. And it's, a, it's I think it's really I, like certainly something that has kept me going through my career. And I've been racing quite a long time. Is that I do like food, and I think I have a fairly balanced diet, and I've, so I've stayed pretty healthy. It's funny, isn't it? You know, about a guilty pleasure. There, there's no real guilt in it because you get the best pleasure from food when you've really trained yes. hard on your bike oh, yeah. so eating eating loads at Christmas is kind of for me it's a bit of a lap down I, oh, food no. tastes the best when you've been out on your yeah. bike and you've trained hard so one it's of, kind of weird one of my best meals ever was a cheese sandwich when I've done a massive hills ride and I was just you know there that you kind go. of food is anything tastes good when you're hungry so yeah, yeah I agree work up an appetite and then enjoy it definitely <laughs> top tip of the day well Emma it has been Fascinating and enlightening. Thanks very much for coming in and answering all those questions. Hope it didn't weigh out too much. But uh, if, kind of weirdly, you haven't already, subscribe to the Global Cycling Network. You can do so for free, and that way you will not miss another video. You can do so by clicking on the globe. Now, we talked quite a lot about two other videos that I think you'd enjoy. If you click just down here, Emma takes you on a tour of her Bond Pro Bike. And if you click just down here, you get a closer look at the KOM Challenge in Taiwan. And don't forget to like and share.